Um, we always appreciate opening our doors to everyone to come and enjoy our beautiful house. Uh, Diana Prigger is going to do the introductions now. So thank you again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, you went by that information, maybe. No, I'm not going forward. 
<laughs> so he comes back to me. He refuses to have his program ever interrupted. Believe me, I've had this problem all my life with this guy. All right, spontaneity is not his joy. I'm not gonna, now, where's the other picture that we just had? I moved to the front. I want to go back. Oh, you're such a baby. Go back. He is the baby of the family. Right. You, you feel this? This is what he did to his brothers. Babies are tyrannical. Who, who is the, how about the guy in the lower right? Yeah, he's here. He's the second one of us. Yeah, the second one of us. The last yeah, to perish. I'm the only one surviving. And then the one on the upper right, that's Norm. I thought he was the good looking one. Yeah. See, yeah. you're already one, Paul. You're just building a little bit now. Oh, he's looking away from the camera. Okay, we're going forward. <laughs> because here they are, oh, 12, 13 years ago, and I took this photo of Paul with all of his brothers. And the beautiful Ted is on the left. And, of course, Paul wearing his Mama Lowe's t shirt. I think right. you did this photograph. I did. Uh, I did. Did you Photoshop I did not. <laughs> I photoshopped practically everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we are with Paul and his dad and mom. Yeah. How many of you have a dad and mom? Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very similar. Okay. All right. Let's go first. His father was a, a minister of the Lutheran Church. And for a time, Paul considered becoming one as well until he read Bertrand Russell. Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah. And also I have some good mentors at the theology school. So they warned him off. Yeah. <laughs> well, before you knew it, in the late mid to late sixties, Paul founded and then edited a magazine, a newspaper in town called The Helix, which if you spent any time in Seattle in the sixties, you knew about it. How many of you knew about the Helix? Raise your hand, please. How many of you were in here in Seattle during the 60s? Raise your hand. So that's interesting. We did not reach any of them. <laughs> they raised their hand but once. I found myself at the age of 10 reading the Helix for the first time, and I would post the news created by Walt Crowley on my wall, and my mother was always offended. Did you say <laughs> news or news? I said news. <laughs> Of course, that led to, here's a wonderful Wall Crowley poster for another adventure uh, of, the, of the Helix, which uh, Paul was the promoter for, and it was the Sky River Rock Festival. Now, how many of you went to the festival? Raise your hand. Oh, we have, we have someone Stand here. up, stand up. It's <laughs> incredible. I think we, your, your picture's coming up. Watch closely, and you may see. Oh, you'll see. You, well, let's take a look. So, of course, there's Paul with his good friend Tom Robbins, or on the Saffron Road. You, did you flirt with Buddhism? Uh, no, I never did. Actually, I read a lot of Buddhism, but I didn't really flirt with it. Yeah. Well, let's look at the picture of your member in the mud. <laughs> Which one are you? So we'll go forward a little bit further. We're going to jump straight down to the beginning of Paul's uh, formal career as a historian, where he wore a tux. He's always keen to say. I like this dress better, and I'm going to point out that this dress relates to the daughters of the Revolution. Mm -hmm. You're not the pioneers. Mm -hmm. American no. Revolution. The yeah, daughters of the American Revolution. Because what we were worried about is that the, the um, you know, the, well, the, 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 the Constitution. Yes. And, uh, what does what does your dress have to do with the Constitution? The, life of, uh, the pursuit of happiness. Uh, you're doing that right now. <laughs> yeah. What are the other two things? Life, life, and liberty. Life, liberty. Life, right, and liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's how I'm dressed today. All right. So to move along, <laughs> this is 294 pages <laughs> of Seattle. I have a microphone. It's 294 Moses of Seattle, which Paul brought out several months before his column, six months before, and sold for 294 cents, and, and claims to have sold upwards of 40,000 copies when it first came out. claiming. Why do you say claim? Because she told me the proof. Well, that's true. So it is a claim. All right, so 
so let's go forward because within six months he had started his column. And of course, uh, you know anybody who that guy is? The other anyone guy? know who this is? Paul's mentor. Who the guy is? He was called the Dean of Northwest Historian. We just had a guest, Murray Morgan. Who is oh. Stan? Where is the guy who said that? Stand up. Let's give him an applause. <laughs> So come and collect your copy of Building Washington. We may not have any to sell, but we're sure to be That's it. You scored it. You I think he thinks that's the book we came to talk about. I don't think so. This book was published in 99, and it won the Governor's Arts Award. And Paul did it with his wife, Jenny McCoy. And it's actually a glorious book filled with facts and figures and stories, and it's kind of marvelous. And Paul has many copies in his basement still to this day. About 300. About 300. So here he is with Lucy Campbell Coe, one of his interlocutors. Uh, and he would have been a member of this organization, Lucy Campbell Coe. She witnessed the Seattle fire when she was a young girl. Oh I knew about five people. Uh, when I was, you know, when I started out, they were all quite old, all of them. She was one of them who remembered the fire. Um, so jump a few years into the future, and we see Paul and me standing at our Mohai exhibit in 2011, where we took over the old Mohai and filled up an entire room with, oh, maybe a hundred now and then photos. And in the foyer of that exhibit... How many are there in the book? In the book, how many? hundred and... Probably 100 plus. So, in the foyer of this exhibit were uh, we, our close friend, Berenger Lamont, who is, who's a Parisian photographer, repeated a number of Parisian photographs. And she actually took this photo of the two of us standing in the foyer. And here we are standing on Paul's back deck with Berenger. And now I'm going to play you, just before we get into the book itself, I'm going to play you a little. Um, I like to. I, I present this as an opportunity to examine the coincidences that occur in your own lives. We've all had them, but this is one that was quite unique and interesting to me and to Paul and to Baron Sherry. Gene is a teacher at uh, Hillside Elementary School in Bellevue. His parents started. Junior high and high school. What's that? It goes through 12th grade. That's right, 12th grade. So he's always looking for lessons. Okay. All right. So. Watch closely and we will see. Uh, you know. We will. I, I want you to see this little moment from 2005, which is kind of a, a mini uh, miracle to me. Here it goes. Is that Paul? Oh, Saying he was unorthodox. <laughs> People say you were unorthodox. He's actually orthodox priest. I know. <laughs> Now, Paul, you can say he was an Orthodox priest, which he was, 
was a Romanian church. But what Paul has hats like that as well. So he was wearing his Ivar's hat, but he so here he is today. But this is about four years ago. Berger found him as a Romanian Orthodox priest who received an award for the restoration of his church in central Paris. But in any case, we found that kind of an amazing coincidence. <laughs> I'm surprised you haven't photoshopped that with your Romanian hat. Now, are you into Photoshop again? <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you a conspiratorist? <laughs> uh, all right, that's all right. I'm too you. All right, let's get to the book. Here we go. So this is our front cover, and we'll just dive right in. And here, oh, oh. In the lecture or speaking engagement hasn't started yet. <laughs> this is the beginning. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Lee. So this is the very first photo that Paul took for the book, which was appeared on January 17th, 1982. And this first photo is of the 63rd uh, Coastal Artillery, who were returning from the First World War in 1919. And they were welcomed back to Seattle by an enormous crowd. And it's a parade of local heroes. We're going to jump forward now to a photo that I took as a repeat from pretty much the same perspective. Is that so in your square right there? Though, this is 4th and Westlake. 4th yeah. and Westlake. Oh, and on January 21st, 2017, I took the following photo. Oh my God. Which was, of course, the largest <laughs> march in Seattle history. Now, let me point out I heard the exclamations. Some of them using the event English was worshipped. And uh, we want to say that this thing is really in my face, isn't it? <laughs> uh, that every picture in this book that Gene has largely put together will have the same response from you. So let's use this as an opportunity to sign up to get this book, several copies of it for you and your kids. <laughs> but you want them to have the pleasure too, don't you? Yeah. Well, Paul can sell as much as he wants, but given our, that we're in a trade war with China, this book was supposed to be here about three or four weeks ago, and it arrives in two days. So it will be in the Port of Tacoma on Thursday. But it's um, there have been slowdowns in Chinese ports, which we have no control over. So we encourage you to, to pre-order. We did bring a few copies today, but, uh, you know. Are we going to sell them? We are going to sell them. Okay. <laughs> Not everybody will get one, but uh, you can sign up and get them later. Here's Paul's original photo taken in. A big fall of 1982. Yeah. With a barista. I bought a coffee from her. I did a, I bought a coffee from her and thanked her. That was Is that men's warehouse looking at the bottom of shape? I haven't followed any of the modern clothiers. <laughs> I don't know who they are. Because we have not dressed in terms of the Constitution. I trust her comfort. <laughs> Is comfort one of the constitutional principles? Oh, that's how I read uh, both the Science Liberty and the Pursuit of Happiness. I think that's comfort. Okay, let's go forward here. All right, so there is our, we, we followed uh, Paul's columns uh, chronologically, so throughout the book, rather than find a theme. For the most part, we just follow along, and the very first column that he brought out is the first column of the book. So that's what the page there looks like. We're going to now jump to the deepest snow that Seattle ever experienced in 1880. Yeah. And over a period of much of the week, much of about eight days, the snow began to fall in January. And it kept falling. And in eight days, 64 inches of snow fell. And the second grade of snow, which we, uh, we don't mention in the book, but we see some of the results of it, was in 1916, when the dome fell oh. of St. James. And that is in the book. We'll see the fallen dome in our... And this looks up Cherry Street. March was built And I went there when it snowed just because every time it snows, there are a handful of Seattle snow photos that I try to do. Okay. Okay. This was in the morning. This was, uh, so you just jumped in your car and jumped out in the car and ran down there. That's 
the fleets. They did a marvelous job, really, of the, the Niles. This book is as valuable as a presentation, regardless of the really sticks that in the face, regardless of the historical clues, just as a document of the city, the contemporary city, this book has got it. So that's another good reason to buy several copies. So this is a photo by the great Norwegian national treasure Anders Nilsson. And he was like here less than a decade. It's just awesome. This looks, it's, this isn't your office small. <laughs> so this is, Anders Bilsa was a major photographer uh, in both Seattle and in Norway. And when he, when he left uh, in, the, in the late 90s, uh, it was because his wife said, I'm moving back to the home country and I'm not coming back to Seattle. So you can join me. She didn't do that. No, she said, I'm going back and then you follow and you can visit too. Then when she got there, she wrote him and said, you come visit, might we agree, but if you don't stay, I'm leaving you. <laughs> so she made him stay. Isn't that a distinction without a difference? <laughs> no, I don't think so. There's added information. Okay, let's go for it. <laughs> so here we are. Anders Wilson was a magnificent photographer. The next, era, the next couple photos are by Anders. And we went back to repeat the waterfront. And you can see the smokestacks. And to me, this brings up that old classic Victorian phrase by the great industrialists, muck is money. <laughs> they would look over the smokestacks of their, of their domains and, and the, the sign of smoke and, and pollution was also a sign of, of greenbacks. They were raking it in, the more smoke poured out. Today, around that same spot, oh, that's right. we have the fountain. Who are those kids, Gene? Well, those are my kids from the elementary school at uh, Hillside, in case you have any grandchildren who are interested in excellent education. <clears throat> Another marvelous Anders Vilsa photos from 1898, and this took place in the height of the Yukon, uh, the gold rush. And in 99 days during the late winter and spring of 1898, 107 ships sailed for the Klondike. Most of them from either north of Madison or south of Columbia. Uh, let's go to our shop today. Another classic Anders Wilson of photo. And here we, and it's about the same spot, just in front of Cold Rock with the Marion wow. Street. All right, guys, what's that bridge there? That bridge. Can anybody identify what bridge that is? Okay. Just keep it up. Did you tell them? I just saw oh. Marion Street. Mm -hmm. They're not paying attention, so it's always telling us what it is. Yes, it's Marion Street. Marion Street over there. Oh, that's a good test on the audience, isn't it? It is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Oh, it's here. We're talking about the pedestrian crossing of the viaduct. Well, that's confusing. You've got a good point. Yeah. All right, you're all forgiven. <laughs> if I'm forgiven, too. So, the Norway actually released a series of stamps with these, uh, when Vilsa got back to Norway. That was after they started to get a postal department. Mm -hmm. Was it? Well, you said they no. began to release stamps. You know. Well, they, they did. Okay, onward. Ah. Well, this is an interesting story because it was taken in 1913 from a prospect that no one had ever reached before at this in this section of town. Any guesses? Smith Tower. Smith Tower. There we go. Well, this was taken before the observation deck was complete, through the the uh, the girders that had not yet been encased, and it is uh, it was taken by uh, a Western Stevens photographer, Frank Noel, and uh, to their surprise, when they reached 20 floors up, they could see Lake Union, they could see Queen Anne, they could see Wallingford in the distance. So it was the very first time that anyone had seen beyond the shoulders of, uh, you know, with such, a, with such an expanded view. And this was, uh, it would be another year before the public would be able to go up to the observation deck and see this same view. Just Let's look at it today, and you can see our current views of Lake Union. Now I think I know why you wanted that picture of me up there. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, here we go. Before you change that picture, just out of curiosity, 
That was about the time the Seattle Metropolitans won the first Stanley Cup hockey Yeah, yeah about the time. Where was, the, where was the, the rink? Must have been in there at picture too. Do we have a pointer anywhere? I don't have a pointer. A lot of people I, I, don't know that the first Stanley Cup was won by the Seattle Metropolitans. Right. Okay, now, if you want to look here, let's see. Where is, okay, I'm going to, well, go to the center of this thing, right? Then go up the street and go to the right, and that's where it is. Okay. In that, in that sort of area there. that's sort of cleared out. Mm -hmm. and that, uh, so if you look just to the left of that area that's sort of cleared out, you can just make out the dome of the Methodist Church, and just to the left of the Methodist Church, there's the way you're going. Oh, yeah, not the way you're looking. Can you Olympic Hotel? Olympic Hotel. Now, if you go and look at the last article that Gene and I did for the Times last Sunday, you'll see it's a picture of the building, the Olympic Hotel, yes. and you'll see also it. see over the top of the construction scene the building in which the hockey club played, which by that time was a, in 1924, it was a garage. So, so watch closely. The Olympic Hotel is on the side of the Olympic, isn't it? The Olympic Hotel, the Olympic is, hotel, is, the Olympic hotel is now. Is on the side where the rink was, isn't it on there? No, next door. Next door, okay. Across Fifth Avenue. Okay. We're in the Avenue. Oh, I'm right about that, Gene. Uh, sure. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. So watch the center of the picture, and I'll, we'll go back and forth twice. This is Third Avenue right here at the bottom. See this one that goes like yeah. that? That means the next one's fourth, and then the next one's fifth. Mm -hmm. And the, um, there's that right up there, yep. <laughs> Any more questions? Paul? No questions. No. Okay, here we go. So watch the center, see if you can make out the dome and the Rainier Club right below it. Yeah. You'll see it in just a second. And watch for Lake Union, too. Oh my gosh. So there's the record. Let's go back. Hold your eyes on that same spot. That's pretty much the same. Now the Rainier Club is on Marion Street, that fourth. And the hotel is two blocks north. That's Spring Street, the fourth. Two blocks in that direction. And so the garage, which was where the uh, hockey plane was done, that's two blocks north and one block in that direction or east. I don't know why I got all that so much in hockey. Somebody's responsible for this. <laughs> oh, you are. Are you a hockey man? No, I work at the athletic club. How do you do? That's some good. Are we speaking at the athletic club? Yes. Okay, we'll see you there. We'll try to change the program by then. So, Shall we continue? <laughs> shall we continue, guys? Do you want to go? Yeah, let's go on. Yeah. Okay. Quit now, or shall we continue? <laughs> All right, let's go on. Here we have the Monongahela, leaving Lake Union after several years being stuck in the lake. And right before the George Washington Memorial Bridge was completed and closed over, that four-master slipped through and was eventually sold in bankruptcy to a Seattle company for just over $8,000, converted to a barge, and sold to a Vancouver logging company, where it survived for a few more years hauling logs before it was scrapped. Let's look at the Aurora Bridge today. Is that coming from a boat yard over at Lake Washington? Speak up. Boat yard at Lake Union. Boat yard at Lake Union. Now we have a little story about something that we discovered in, after creating this, this book. This is the Taft Key, presented to William Howard Taft by a former Yukon gold miner in 1909. And if you look closely, you can just, if you squint, you can see that around the key and on the keypad itself are nuggets of gold from Yukon. Now, it's significant because it actually informs the next slide here. Oh my goodness. This is February 22nd, 1932, which was the 200th 
200th anniversary of George Washington's birth, and they were about to open up the George Washington Memorial Bridge on the anniversary. The crowds were positioned on either side, many thousands of them, and an opponent of the Aurora Bridge, an opponent of the construction, was Governor Roland Hartley, who always never been an advocate to begin with, but he was a long-winded orator. And so he stood as Herbert Hoover in Washington, D.C., with his finger poised on the Taft key, waited until 2.57 that day to press the key and start the festivities. Well, Hartley kept talking and talking and talking and, and taking credit for all of the, you know, the we don't know any politicians like that today, of course. But uh, Hartley kept chattering away at 2.57, 3,000 miles away, 3,000 miles away, the key was pressed. The water, the fireboats shot off their streams of water, fireworks went off, the big flag up at the top descended, and crowds streamed onto the bridge from either side, interrupting Hartley, and he never finished his speech. <laughs> The tap key. So let's look at this today. You, you are all familiar with this, our lovely Aurora Bridge. And we're going to go forward a little bit because that tap key had, here's, here's Hoover pressing it. <laughs> We've got, no, you got it. Taft, I think tap was gone by the time Hoover had it at 32. <laughs> but it was also used on another occasion. Because the tap key opened up AYP, tapped, pressed it to set off the opening festivities of the Alaska Yukon. And 1909. in 1909. Nine, no, it, was, it wasn't 1909. 1909. Yeah. That's the year that Taft visited the fair. Oh, and so he used the key in 1909 to, to open it. So in, 19, in 1962, John F. Kennedy used the same key to open the Seattle World's Fair 50 years later. How well, many of you went to the Seattle World's Fair? Raise your hands. Anybody that didn't go to it, raise your hand. What were you doing those days? <laughs> here yet, more, more yet. Well, on the screen you see Paula Dahl, who was a nine million visitor to the fair, and she became VIP for the day. I think she was six years old. Wow. And on the right, there so she is sign. holding the nine million sign in front of her class at Issaquah Elementary. Mm -hmm. Or Sunset, home of the soccer. Mm -hmm. Sunset Elementary. 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60. 2012? And this is, yeah, that's about 2012. Yep. And so she, and you can see in the old photo, her sister is perched behind her, glowering. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you're two years old. Test it, test it. No, I'll press it down. No, actually, it's going in and out. So we'll, we'll do what we can. So, <laughs> can I turn it off, Paul? Uh, I can, just yeah, no, okay. I'll just shout. That's okay. So here we are. We are now looking at. The, one of the few photos of the Seattle fire, taken during the fire. Uh, Paul posits in his original column that many of the photographers were saving their equipment. So this was a, this was a shot looking down First Avenue, and uh, uh, you can see the tall building up in the center left is the Fry Opera House, and if you squint, you can see someone standing right at the very, right on the rooftop, watching down from above. All of these buildings were destroyed during the fire. Nothing remained. Can you in the back hear him okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Go ahead. All right. Here we are at the same spot. First Avenue. It's spring. Let's continue. And then we see the ruins of the fire. And of course, there's a location which all of you will be familiar with. And if you look at the, on the right-hand side of the photo, the sort of the standing pillars, the doorway, with what looks like a window up above, you'll just catch a glimpse of its future incarnation when we look past the Pioneer Building to the 
sinking ship garage. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Are any of you confused by the idea of the sinking ship garage? Do you know what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. yes. You don't know what we're talking about. Who, who, raise your hand if you do not know. Do not. As the expression is oh, We're going to go straight there and we can explain it. So let's go forward. Here's what was there oh, in 1908. Yeah. And this is uh, the Seattle Hotel. Built and after the 89 fire. Built after the 89 fire, along with the Pioneer Building on the left, which was also built shortly thereafter. And it's still there. So the Seattle Hotel was a gorgeous spot, and it was replaced today by what is called the Sinking Ship Garage. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And it's built on the same footprint, <laughs> and it has the same uh, Little, the prow at the at the front, uh -huh. and it actually led us as a city into a preservationist movement, which probably we can credit with saving the market. Victor Steinbrook uh, was um, inspired by the loss of the Seattle Hotel and the conversion of that hotel into a rather hideous garage <laughs> to run up north a few years later and lead the the preservation of the market. You should tell them about the uh, promise of the builders of the garage. Oh, let's look. So the builders of the garage were very sensitive. Yeah. <laughs> and here's what they did, Paul. Oh, well, okay. You see the basket handle windows on the uh, Merchant Cafe across the street? Yeah. On the south side of Yesterday Way? Yeah. You know, the basket handle oh, yeah. tops. Right. Uh, the builders of the garage did the same thing yeah. for the garage. You oh, can see yeah. up on top there. Yeah. The <laughs> roofs, uh, the croquet right. roofs. That, that was their aesthetic sens sensitivity. Yeah. That was their sensitivity. It was, and it revealed such great sensitivity. <laughs> <laughs> honor it's to this there? day. It's still there, It's yeah. still there? Okay. You you know, I, I guess I don't look up when I'm Many of us go and visit. We, yeah. we pay homage to the. <laughs> Once a year, Paul and I go down on April 1st. <laughs> April Fool's! <laughs> why, why didn't Warehouse do a community thing and built a new headquarters and buy that sinking ship garage? What's that? that? Why didn't Warehouse build their new headquarters there? You know, um, we, did, we did use this loss to save the market, so that probably gives us a... a that's an excuse, I suppose, but still, there is, a, there is more than a silver lining. And here is the market. 1907, just as it's being filled up with the farmers and the sellers, and we're just about to become uh, one of the great institutions of Seattle, which we will look at today. Yay. There we are. <laughs> That's the corner market building on the right, which was not yet built in 1907, as we saw in the previous photograph. There's the hoops, too. And uh, City Councilman T.P. Ravel pronounced the market is yours. I dedicate it to you, and may it prove a benefit to you and your children. It is for you to protect, defend, and uphold, and it is for you to see that those who occupy it treat you fairly. This is one of the greatest days in the history of Seattle. That was in 1907. That's true, wow. too. Now, you've heard of Ravel, haven't you? The yes, politician? Yes. Well, that was his grandfather or father. The Ravel you knew was on uh, the city council, or was it the county council? Yeah. County council, yeah. And he just died. Did he just, just died? died? Yeah. Was he your friend? Well, neighbor. Yeah. So we look forward. Kind of a nice guy, I think. Yeah. yeah. We look forward now to the mid 50s. And this is an interesting location in Seattle. Little known, filmed uh, take by a marvelous uh, Boeing engineer photographer named Werner Lengenhager. And uh, let's look at it today. I'd like to walk the streets of the city with his camera. After work, of course. And before, I think this is probably and during dawn. Dawn. And during work. Today, oh, oh, oh. we're looking right into the heart of the city. And he knew that I-5 was coming, and so he yeah. made a point of documenting that these lovely little alleyways. That so what, what year is the alleyway, Richard? Mid-50s, mid-55. He lives yeah. two blocks east of that spot, right up the hill. 
We're looking now at the corner of 3rd and Union, looking towards that corner. This is the post office. And the steps and the columns were made of chuckanut sandstone. And the complaint over decades was that the pigeons pooped on the sandstone and discolored it. So they made the wise decision in 1958 to, to replace it. <laughs> yeah. 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 With well, glass glass curtain. Curtain. Glass curtain, yeah. And the pigeons don't dare poop on that steel. Well, they're going to slip right down it. Now tell me, how many of you remember that uh, Beau Arts uh, Chuckanut Sandstone Post Office? Any of you remember it? One of you? Okay. All right. It was a common refrain heard in Seattle to meet me on the steps. And when they when when you would be asked to do so, it was always these steps to which they were referring. Made of delicious yellow chuckanut sandstone. Oh. Well, okay. And here we are at Hooverville, taken from the top of the BF Goodrich building in the mid-30s. This is about 250 of the 500 houses on this stretch of what is now Dockland and what was Docksland before it became Hooverville. Watch Smith Tower and you'll see the modern representation which the Port of Seattle kindly uh, set me up in a, um, in a lift truck to get to close to the same height because the building no longer exists. Mm -hmm. wow. Can you make that out and see the, the Smith Tower wow. repeating on that between there the two? You can go back and forth. There you go. Oh, there it is. Where, where was the BF Goodrich building? Was it down there by, by Starbucks? It, it, it was a building of no consequence except the BF Goodrich. It was just a little warehouse, two stories high, okay. maybe two and a half. Yeah. It was right where uh, where you would stand if you wanted to look over the. Uh, no, as we just looked at it. So it wasn't a large building. It was just via Goodrich when it was a young, uh, uh, a young presence in the town. So now we're looking at Fremont, and this is uh, uh, the joy in this photo is the is not in the then but in the now, because it is our first one and only nude in the book or in the column. You mean wow. nudes, don't you? Well, there's one. There's a couple <laughs> nudes in the book. Well, let's take a look. This is one of the last trolleys uh, passing through Fremont before it was converted all to gasoline buses. And if we take a look, we can see from last year the Fremont Fair. About the same corner. I don't see it do anywhere in there. Uh, you're not looking hard enough. I don't know what the nude is, maybe. Oh, and then we descend to, we head down to Chinatown for the Go Hing Festival in 1920, and this was, again, let's see, the photographer in this festival was another Webster and Stevens photographer taking celebration in May of that year, and to repeat it, of course you discover that Chinatown has not changed much at all. I went to the Seattle Kung Fu Society where Sifu John Leung has been the uh, master there since 1960, and actually a teacher of Bruce Lee. And he brought his whole crew down onto the street. And we received the photograph. And John, who just turned 80, is right in the middle behind the group of three boys. And quite active and, and leaping and hopping. The King Street? That is, yes, that is on King. I want to Oh, thank you. Here, of course, we have. A photo from before Lake Washington was lowered. And that's significant because this is a river that no longer exists in any above ground form. You might find it bubbling around in a culvert or in a swamp somewhere, but for the most part it has disappeared and we call it, the next slide should tell you, they called it. The Black River. Mm. And today, it's a McDonald's. it came out of Lake Washington and took a serpentine route, meeting the Duwamish River and then winding up in Elliott Bay. Well, it, it meant the green which formed the Duwamish. The Green River 
went into the White River and they made the Duwamish River. Yeah. And also, the Black River had a, uh, the uh, Cedar River flow into it. The Cedar, the Cedar River now goes out the into the lake. Into the lake. Yeah. It, what was the outflow? Right through of the, the uh, Boeing plant. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So here we are at Lake Union with the Brown children. And these are the faces that sold another, what, 50,000 books? I don't know. A lot of first volume, Seattle Now and Then, volume 1, 1984. Now, how many of you have several copies? Please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's look at this site today because, of course, Lake Union changed as well. This is the uh, Owen family. And Tia and Liana, who uh, this photo was taken in 2011, and here they are this year, having grown six years. Oh. <laughs> and of course, the beloved Kalakala. How many have ridden on the Kalakala? Quite a few. Well, the Kalakala had the, the marine equivalent of a single stroke engine uh, because it was very noisy and the whole thing shook. Quite a bit. Do you remember that, you who have wrote on the. No. You do remember it? And quite a noise. And is it got a speed? I don't, because I, don't, I wasn't around to take it, but my mother was, and she actually, at the age of 15, uh, had uh, a loose tooth and lost it. Oh, the lock of the sink. So here's a great crowd going through the locks. And I covered my insurance. It wasn't. They didn't have insurance. Her father was a Presbyterian minister. They didn't believe in insurance right, yeah. by faith. So I went back uh, in spring of 2017 and, and captured another large vessel going through. And it turns out, and I didn't know this at the time, but this is the Turner Joy, which uh, for, for those of you who are fans of, of naval history or American history, it's a, it's a significant boat. Any guesses? I will say go. Uh, yep. Gulf of Tonkin. That's Gulf of Tonkin. Yeah. It Didn't is you the already win a prize. <laughs> no, it's I, so it was the second boat involved in the, the of the major craft involved in the Gulf of Tonkin. The USS Maddox was in a skirmish with North Vietnamese uh, uh, torpedo boats, and the first one was real. And two days later, uh, August 6, 1964, was, um, was evidently constructed out of whole cloth, but it provided enough excuse for us to go to work. Mm -hmm. See, that's impressive. You know all those dates. Are you a military historian? No, I'm not. But I did investigate the Turner Joy, which is now a Bremerton Museum ship and was being towed from its restorative uh, month in Lake Union back to Bremerton. At this do they have a trip to history inside? No. They do. And here it is off the coast of Vietnam. <coughs> and now we're looking at something which is soon to disappear. Oh my. This is before the opening day in April of 1953, yeah. before opening day of the Viaduct. Are you going to take a picture on January whatever, 11th? 2000? I can't walk very well, but Jean, I bet will be there. Take another picture. In fact, we have a little project we're working on to, to take pictures all up and down the viaduct before it's taken down. Who are we? History Link, me, the Department of Transportation. Okay. How about me, History Link, the Department of Transportation? <laughs> that's fine. I think that's, again, a distinction without a difference. That is definitely a distinction without a difference, except in the Connotations of uh, here's my repeat of that, and there's a lovely building that both Paul and I enjoy up against the Columbia Tower. It's the F5 building, and it's almost finished. But we discovered that the that the architect of the F5 building it has those odd lightning slashes on it, and evidently the architect was inspired by a photograph of Audrey Hepburn smoking a cigarette, and she's sort of wearing her fashionable clothes, and she's tilted to one side with her cigarette. And you can make out, evidently, those are the lines that this guy used to design this, this structure. Is there any chance you could get that picture? I, I was looking for it. 
I was looking for it. I haven't found it yet. But that, that would be good. So here we are looking over a North Seattle lake, and we're just going to hurry on through. This was taken by Alfred Curtis in 1903, and much has changed at that North Seattle lake. It's Green Lake, on whose North Shore I live, and here it is today looking over the freeway. You can't see the lake. You can just make out the mountains on the, in the very center, below the crow. You can see those same mountains. <laughs> As a neighbor of the lake, how do you use the lake, Gene? Oh, we swim in it. We boat on it. We walk, walk around. around. Yeah. Okay. Then I got a boat. <coughs> you rent boats. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So here we are, and this is a photo that was actually given to Paul by a famous Seattleite. And it's of the oldest structure currently existing in Seattle. This is it. You're looking at, there was no plaque to mark its spot. There's a little stub at the corner. I think Clay can attest to that. We say shame on the Southwest Seattle Historical Society for you. not putting up a plaque. This house was built by Doc Maynard in the 1860s. It's still there. Talk about that photo, Paul. Well, this is uh, the woman in the white skirt there on the stepway. That's uh, April uh, Hagland. Uh, oh, Ivar's mother. mother. This is the Hansen family no. with Ivar Hagland's mother in white on the steps. No. Yeah, right. and, uh, uh, and Ivar gave this, he didn't actually. Paul stole this photo from Ivar. That's not true at all. I'm going to explain what it is. Did you give it back? It's, yeah, it's part of the archive. I organized the Acres archive. I even made, built the shelving for it and its facets. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. I didn't steal it. Please, Gene, why do you spread these rumors? Because you said it two days ago. You said, oh, I did steal it. I tried to be sensational. Yeah, sensational or not. Well, let's look at it today because we do have members with Clay of the Southwest Seattle Historic Society standing in front of this house, which is on 64th, just off of Alki. And you can visit, but there's no clock. There's nothing to tell you that you're visiting the oldest structure extended Seattle. Yes. There it is. Take some incense with you. Yes, Light sir. it and stick it in the front lawn. Go to, go to Spuds Fish and Chips. What's that? And you can stop at Spuds, too. Yes. I had a friend with a renting room in that house. I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. That's it. it. And it's kind of run down. It's sort of, it's, it's, uh, it's not, well, it is a little. I've been in it. It's a little bit, it's like a renter house. I've been in it. <laughs> I'm just going to fight you every step of the way. Uh, Baby uh, of the family. I'm not predicting you because you're uh, uh, When were you last there? Uh, 20 years. Never mind. Okay. What were you going to say? Spuds has a historical photo collection in the lobby. Who put it in there? Well, you weren't mentioning it, so I thought. Oh, well, Paul installed that historical photo well, collection in Spuds. Spuds has that. Thanks to you. That's Bert. right. Yeah. But also, uh, they haven't uh, paid me yet for that. That Spuds <laughs> is owned by Ivers. And yes. Spuds is owned by uh, an independent. You are correct in every it's respect. Like, you can tell because the charter is different. Yeah. And Paul oh, has yeah. been created. If you go into Ivers, you will see that all of those historical photos in Ivers and in the Alki Spuds were, were put there by Paul and annotated. So if you want a more history, Head on down, and you'll you'll see them there. Nevertheless, it's a house that is as yet as yet unmarked. So, so is the Maynard House picture split? Pardon? Is the Maynard House picture F split? It's from Ivar, so yeah. Paul. Nobody said it. Okay. Yeah. I, want to, I want to tell that. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, sir. A year ago, our uh, working with uh, Ron Edge, who's a contributor to the column and works a uh, former Boeing engineer. Uh, and a photo collector, and he volunteers at Mohai, Ron triangulated several photos and came up with a precise location for Princess Angeline's shack, which is right here. And it was always known to be below, between the market, between Western and, and the waterfront. But uh, Ron actually went through the roof lines and, and found a pretty close to precise location. And what I love about this is that it's still, it's the only little section which is still open air. And Ron is sitting about on the porch right up against the Pike Place Market garage on the left and the Fix Medora building on the right. And bamboo running up behind all the way up to Western. 
but what I think is just fabulous about this is that it's that that little snippet is still on uh, is still open to the air. Yeah. Do you so. think it's because they couldn't? It's not a buildable lot, or they couldn't sell it, or the stairway? I don't know the, yeah. the reason for it. You said it's, real estate. No. It's only twenty five feet wide. They've sold every other lot. Yeah. There's not a single area which has not been sold. And it's probably the hand that, that touches the. What's your, it's the hand that touches the elbow. Yeah, we'll get there. We're getting there. That's next. This is where Paul and I really, really come to blows. <laughs> because here we have. have play decide which one's telling the truth. Okay, so here, here we have Princess Angeline. Also, her actual name was Kiki Sobu. She's sitting in on Pike Place, uh, as it is now, and now it is Post Alley. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you can see First Avenue up behind her. This is about 1890, just shortly after the fire. Mm -hmm. The inset is the only photograph of Chief Seattle, her father. And we, uh, with Clay's help, we assembled two direct descendants of both Princess Angeline and Chief Seattle. And they're sitting in their relative positions. That's uh, on, let's just look. Here we have Mary Lou Slaughter, who's a direct descendant of Kiki Sobu, and Ken Workman, who is a direct descendant of Chief Seattle through his second wife. And they are both four greats down and at a grand. And uh, Mary Lou is turned 80 this year. And Ken Workman is in his mid-late 60s now. And Mary Lou is one of the preeminent basket weavers, uh, cedar basket weavers and shawl and hat makers. And she just is, a, she's extremely proud of her heritage. But here they are sitting on that same spot. And as we took this picture, Ken whipped around a couple times. And a, a little bit later, and here's Clay taking a photo of me, taking a photo of the two of them. So for about a 10 minute period, I was shooting them in this spot in the market. And as Clay took this photo, uh, Ken was darting around, looking around, and later I asked him, well, Ken, what, what were you doing? He says, well, while you were taking the photos, I, I, someone did this to me. Tapped him on the elbow. Now, there was no one behind him. And Clay was watching me, and I was watching them. No one approached Ken. But he felt this nudge from, and I like to say it's a nudge from history. Paul thinks that I'm encouraging phony spiritualism, <laughs> that I'm just, I've, I've tipped over to the dark side or the wispy side or whatever it is. But I think this is a marvelous example of being touched by history. I'm willing right now to settle this problem because we have to go through a lot of these talks together. Uh, all right. I think Clay should decide. Why not let the audience decide? Let, let's let, because I wanted Clay to do it. Okay. Clay, you were there, you took a picture of the scene. What was happening then? I know Ken and I believe Ken. What does it mean to believe him? He believes him. I, I, what does it mean? Let him answer, not you. Would you just relax? <laughs> Tell us, Clay. I believe Ken was honest in telling the story. Well, He's a very spiritual guy. What does honest mean? I think he felt the tap on his elbow. Oh, you stand for that? Sure. Okay, I'll stand for that. But isn't it something in Indian uh, that they don't like to have some, some ethnics? Uh, don't want an image of themselves on film? Is that, and then maybe by doing that, you're going to blur the picture? Maybe. I, I, I never heard that from, from Ken or from Mary Lou or from, uh, from uh, natives of the Northwest. I know the Navajos are very sensitive about, about um, even saying the name of someone after their death. Yeah. But I, I don't know about Northwest Coast Indians. So. Also, is that some of her cedar weaving there? That is. Yeah. You're looking at her work on both Ken's head, which we had to take off because of the shadow. And uh, she created both of those shawls. And both of those hats and shawls, each shawl now sells for like $6,000. So she sold a, uh, a beautiful cedar basket to uh, an old friend of ours, uh, 
uh, Vi Hilbert. And Vi said, how much for that cedar basket? Vi was a, a Salish tribe member who, um, who became a, a, a cultural scholar and a linguistic scholar. And so she sold the basket to Vi for $3,000. So she, did, she gave her a, a, a little break, but not much of one. So, and that is it. Thank you so much. There's Paul. Tell them a little more about when these books might be around. Well, the book arrives. Well, the book arrives on Thursday, and then we have to wait for U.S. Customs to to send their dogs sniffing through the various volumes to make sure there's nothing smuggled inside, I guess. And so, but we did bring along a couple boxes, and if you would like to have a signed copy by Paul right now, we are happy and to Jean. do so. And Gene. And Gene. Uh, you actually brought some books. We did. How many you got? I think we have. We have fourteen. Seven in a box. Oh, I think you're going to sell out here, probably. Yeah. Look at that. All right. Uh, well, we thank you both very much for my your chapter. Yeah. Such a pleasure to have met you That's both. Right. Thank, thank you for having you. us. Is, doesn't our arguing bother you at all? No, no, I grew up in a large family. It's quite so good. It doesn't come to the house. He said he's right. Oh, that's good. All right. Jesus. Thank you. Oh, the price is forty nine ninety five. And to you, it's and we take credit cards, checks, cash, however, if you're if you're interested. And of course, uh, as Paul has is wont to say, our signatures. Add a nickel per no. pack. At no. least. No, no. Really? I'm going to charge for this. Who told you that? No way. See, this is the problem. He doesn't trust it. I don't. I'm sorry. It's a dime. You're overvaluing. If we sign these books, and that increases the value of each book by a dime. It's 50.05. It's 50.05. Uh, 50.05, but don't pay. Well, thank you guys. Oh,